Let me start over again. Welcome, welcome, welcome to this session of the Black Family Home Educators um, and Scholars Teach-In, second annual teach-in. This is a very special time with Professor Parker, Akil Parker, and I want to call your attention his YouTube that will rival Khan Academy. If you need help with math, Professor Parker is our person that we need to be going to. Um, he is has a pro, has an organization called All This Math. Outside, it's outside of Philadelphia, but he can help you anywhere. Um, without further ado, I'm going to let Dr. Parker take this over, and I'll put up your slides. Well, I appreciate the title, but I don't have a PhD. Yeah, but I like seeing you call yourself professor. I like that. It's coming. Just want to Maybe. put that out there. You know, you know, the older black folks in our history used to call themselves professors, <laughs> even the principals of, of schools and things, and they didn't have PhDs either. So oh, there's that. something about that professor. Go ahead, own it. Okay. All right. So um I'm glad, I'm really glad to be here. Um, I'm glad to be in this space um, of people that have been homeschooling and have, you know, taken it upon themselves to fulfill the responsibility of educating their own children, their own biological children. And, you know, in many cases, in terms of homeschool collectives um, of educating and facilitating the education of other children as well, um, even if they're, they're not biologically connected. Um, you know, we're all part of the community. So my, my presentation title is The Community Must Support and Promote Homeschooling. And what, what this, this presentation is about is kind of like a culmination of a lot of thoughts and observations that I've made um, throughout my past of being a formal um, um, high school mathematics teacher in you know, public schools and charter schools and in, in, inside Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And also, since I started all this math in a, back in 2017, um, work that I've done with homeschool collectives in terms of tutoring, which initially I, I, I primarily offer tutoring to um, students and also some adults that are adult learners um, that may need help with, with different areas of mathematics. But I realized that when I was providing, when I would provide and still do provide assistance in terms of, um, homeschool, homeschool students and homeschool collectives, I'm really teaching. So I had to kind of get over that and kind of realize that, okay, I'm not like, this isn't like just a student that's coming to me with, um, with their homework that I'm like giving them homework help with. that I'm actually, I had to realize like, wait, no, I'm actually like developing curriculum and, you know, kind of, you know, you know, kind of pushing them, you know, forward um, as if they were a student in a classroom. So I'm really um, kind of honored to be like part of part of this community in this space uh, with with you all. Um, you can advance to the next slide. So just a lot, I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about myself because I really want to get into the, the content in this presentation. So but just a little bit, um, I'm a father. Um, I, like I've mentioned already, I've been a high school mathematics teacher for 16 years, um, kind of by accident. I, I didn't go to school. I didn't get an undergraduate degree in education. I got an undergraduate degree in finance. Originally, I wanted to be an investment banker or some type of equities trader and go to Wall Street and make a million dollars and, you know, ex exploit people. Um, I didn't know I would be exploiting people, but, you know, I realized, you know, how, how the banking system really works. So I'm kind of glad that that didn't work out. I spent one year as a, as a bank examiner with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation before becoming a, a full time high school math teacher at a, at a small charter school in, in Philadelphia. And I really never looked back. I. Um, and it's, you know, one of the best, uh, I guess, mistakes, so to speak, you know, that I've ever made, you know, in my life, uh, becoming a teacher and also becoming a math teacher. And it really was a way for me to try to um, pro provide something to the community, you know, that I was a part of. Because one of the things I said to myself was that I didn't want to just be um, an elder that was very critical of the youth. I wanted to kind of be on the front line. Um, can, can you go back? Oh, can you go back to the previous slide? <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so I wanted to be on the front line. It's, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, I wanted to be on the front line, um, really providing help and really providing assistance, you know, in, in the way, in the way that I could, you know, cause that was, that was one of my, my skill, that was part of my skill set, mathematics. Um, and about four years ago, I got an opportunity to do some, um, 
college level teaching. I started out teaching at LaSalle University, which is a small liberal arts school in Philadelphia. And then from there, I got an opportunity to work at Cheney University, historically black college, the first historically black college, um, unless you ask a person that graduated from Lincoln, they'll tell you they're the first. Um, that's debatable, but we don't have time for that right now. But, um, you know, so, you know, but I learned a lot about in terms of in my study of history, which ties into um, something we were talking about earlier, um, histematics, which is a, a framework and a methodology that I've, I've developed. Um, one of the reasons that I appreciate teaching at a historically black college and especially Cheney University is because of my study of Octavius Cato. And Octavius Cato was a mathematics professor at Cheney University. Well, when it when it used to be called the Institute for Colored Youth, and it was located in Philadelphia. Um, so, you know, learning about people like him, uh, and of course, you know, even like studying um, scholars, African-centered scholars like Dr. Shape and Anta Jope, and, you know, people like that, it really, at some point in my career, earlier years back, made me want to take my, my teaching much more seriously. Um, and then also, it kind of helped me to see how, you know, looking at things through a political lens, it helped me to see how, you know, this system, the, the current school system, whether it's public schools, charter schools, is really not meant to empower our children. And as as do what Dr. John Henry Clark said was that, you know, the purpose of education should be to res, um, produce children that are responsible handlers of power. Um, and then we also, if we go to Amos Wilson, the late Amos Wilson as well, um, when he always talked about how education is meant to teach people to be able to solve their own problems instead of just the problems of, of other people. So it's with those two kind of definitions of education in mind that I realized that, you know, we have to really get to um, the, get serious about and become successful at developing a network of independent African-centered schools. And I really, I see homeschooling as a model that we can become more intentional about, you know, people that aren't already already doing this work. Um, I think people that aren't already doing this work need to start to have more conversations with people that have been homeschooling um, for years or even not as long um, so that we can learn, okay, like what, what, are, what are your best practices? Like, what have you been doing? And not, and not, of course, so we can, of course, not so we can create like a, just a black version of the current school system um, that's just as oppressive and just as, you know, limiting, but so we can create something that is, you know, wholesome and create something where you won't want to take, pull your children out of it because it's not really serving them, you know, in the way that a school should. And, and again, it's not solving those, those two problems, you know, or it's not attempting to reach those two goals of developing our children to be responsible handlers of power and also um, to, be a, to be equipped to solve our own problems. Right. Um, and I also, you know, I kind of think of myself as a as a hybrid homeschooler. I was I, I did actually um, I was actually homeschooled for one year. My mother homeschooled me for a year when I was about six years old, I want to say. Um, ended up dropping out of a school that I was attending when I was very young because of transportation issues. And she ended up teaching me at home. So, you know, I kind of overlooked that. So I just wanted to mention that and throw that out there. So I've always kind of had an appreciation of homeschooling to an extent. Um, but then, you know, one of the things I am going to talk about in, in the presentation is a lot of the negative propaganda around homeschooling, which I think I'm, I'm sure it's meant to discourage us from participating in homeschooling, you know, whether it's, you know, depictions of people in movies or just, you know, just a lot of just commentary that you may see on social media or, you know, things you hear people say. But um, like I mentioned, I did already mention this. So I'll say it again. You know, I have I have taught um, homeschoolers um, through my capacity at all this math as a tutor. Um, I've, I've actually, but I, I, my role is actually not a tutor, but it's more of a teacher um, for students that are being homeschooled. Um, and I've also done work with homeschool collectives as well in, in the Philadelphia area. We can advance to the next slide. So this is uh, one of the you know more famous Malcolm X quotes, at least with me, that really resonates with me, and it kind of it serves as a as a motivator. You know, um, only a fool would let his enemy teach his children, and you know it really serves as a motivator in that you know in terms of I mean, keeping with his you know idea idea was objective of black nationalism, and then later his objective of Pan African nationalism, that you know we have to you know build institutions that are meant to serve us, and we have to be fully responsible for the maintenance and the promotion of those institutions. Educational institutions to me are 
are foundational and the most um, among the most important institutions, if not the most important, because it is, you know, from it is from educational institutions that we develop our people into whatever they're going to become. And, you know, it, that determines how they're going to be able to serve the collective. Um, but again, but the, the, but then, you know, this is like kind of theoretical and anecdotal and it sounds good in theory. So but, you know, while I'm while I'm a teacher in um, a public school system, charter school system, and while I have biological children of my own that are, you know, in these, in these spaces. I have, I have a son that attends Philadelphia public schools. I have a daughter um, that attends a Catholic school. Now, my daughter attending a Catholic school, that, that's a, that's a co-parenting issue, you know, that I don't need to get into, but it's a, you know, an issue of, uh, you know, choosing battles and whatnot. And that's, and that's realistic. That's, that's real life, you know, for many people that are in co-parenting situations. But I still like to say that, um, this this uh, this quote is motivation has always been kind of motivation for me to do the work of trying to work toward move toward creating these institutions where we won't have to send our children to um, to enemies, so to speak, where they don't have to kind of be, you know, they won't have to be like the spook that sat by the door or they don't have to be kind of um, um, vaccinated by us before we send them into those spaces, you know, to and, you know, where we have to protect them from you know the you know the the, the eurocentrism um, the white supremacy mythology um the you know the this this the neo-colonial you know oppression that really takes place you know in these spaces um so you know that's that's part of you know why again as, as i mentioned earlier that that i believe that i firmly believe there needs to be a um a vast network of um definitely nationally and even globally of independent african center schools for our children so let me, if you could advance to the next slide. So from that, I have like an essential question that, that I've come up with is that if, if independent African center schools are integral to solving our collective, political, economic, as well as cultural problems, how do we bring them into existence though, right? So, cause it sounds good to say, you know, in theory, but you know, how do we actually do it? Like, you know, what are the, the devil is in the details, right? So what I say is that we have to build, we have to build them, you know, as our ancestors have done. And we have homeschooling models available to us that we can use as leverage for this task. And if the community wants this, then it must support and actively promote homeschooling. And I think like homeschooling is like, like a missing link within that work. Because like homeschooling is kind of, I would even, I would even argue that among some, among many people, even in the, you know, the more progressive community of, of, of black people, if they're not involved in homeschooling themselves, then even in their own minds, you know, we may, you know, and perhaps I've been guilty of this in the past, even homeschooling is even marginalized, you know, by us. And I think that we have to make a connection with homeschoolers and with homeschooling as, a, as an institution um, to try to, you know, embrace it, promote it, learn from it and try to get our own children and as you know, many children as we can involved in this type of work. Because this, this, because homeschooling is in and of itself, it's independent. And this is, it's, it's an independent institution, even if it's not a, even if a homeschool is not a, a large brick and mortar building with, uh, you know, 2,500 students in it, it's still an institution, you know. Next slide, please. So, and one of the things that, I, that I've realized is that if in the meantime, you know, if our, the majority, vast majority of our children will be attending these public schools and these charter schools, there at, at a minimum, there needs to be a paradigm shift, a serious paradigm shift. And, you know, the paradigm shift is that these schools that they attend must become either just places of practice or just reinforcement centers for skills, right? as opposed to the places of their primary education. Um, and this kind of this kind of gets back to the Malcolm X quote. So because I've, I've always thought about that quote and I thought about like, well, how can we really realistically try to bring that to fruition, at least like as an initial an initial step, like what would the initial goal be? So, you know, while we may still our children may still attend these schools because the alternative independent school has not been had has not been built yet. Um, it's, it's not, you know, able to serve those, those children that are attending the charter schools and the public schools. We can, at a minimum, if the community can take responsibility for the primary education, even if it's, it's calculus and trigonometry, 
somebody in the community, we have to create a way for somebody in the community, somebody on the block, somebody in the neighborhood to be able to provide, or somebody online to provide, you know, instruction in calculus and, and trigonometry or organic chemistry or any subject that they'll be responsible for in those schools. Um, so that way, when they go into the school, it just becomes a place of practice. So the vulnerability that is, nece is necessary in, um, in, in an educational circumstance or situation won't even be required because it's difficult to be vulnerable for any person, adult or child, to a person that doesn't like you, doesn't respect your humanity, um, doesn't, you know, doesn't consider you a human and, you know, doesn't want to, you know, embrace you, you know, in, in that way. But if I'm only going in, if like, listen, if I'm sitting in an algebra two course and I'm in a public school or in a, in a charter school and, you know, my elders or my old heads have already basically given me the skills of, of algebra two and have taught me in the community or in the house or in the basement or at the dining room table um, with, a, with another, you know, some other youth, similar to the way a homeschool collective is operated. Then when I go into that school, I'm really just going there just to practice what my what my elders and my old heads have already taught me. Um, and that creates a very different scenario because then it's almost like with sports. It's like a lot of, you know, there's star athletes that go and attend certain schools because those schools get certain exposure from um, from college recruiters, um, you know, on a, on a high school level. So but it's like they're not going there to learn how to play basketball. They're not going there to learn how to play football. They're not going there to learn how to play, you know, tennis or baseball or whatever the sport may be or how to run track. They're just going there to practice and develop the skills that they already have that have already been imparted to them from other spaces, spaces that were probably much more nurturing um, and had, you know, where they received much more love. So this is this is the paradigm shift, you know, that, I, that I'm talking about, you know, in the meantime that I think. Um, has to take place. And, you know, as I mentioned, it's going to, it would eliminate some of the negative effects of these neo-colonial schools uh, that are visited upon our youth. Because like I said, that that vulnerability is, is not required, you know, because it's different if I'm sitting in class and I go in cold and I don't understand how to solve a system of equations at all. And the teacher is just talking and talking and he or she is not really explaining it in a way that I understand. But then I don't have the requisite trust for this person. And they, they've expressed to me and let me know that they, you know, may be racist or, you know, maybe have, have class, there may be class antagonisms um, because, you know, they may have an idea or, you know, either they may have a realistic understanding or just an assumption about my socioeconomic status. So there's like this, this rift between us. And then I don't even feel comfortable raising my hand asking for further, in, in further explanation, you know, but if the community, was able to teach me how to teach um, that child how to uh, solve a system of equations through the substitution method or the elimination method or through graphing or through Kramer's rule with matrices or whatever, whatever the method. And then I go into your class, then I go into your classroom and I just need to practice problems, you know, and I can kind of follow along. So that's, that's, things are very different in that situation. Next slide, please. So again, I mentioned like the stigma around homeschooling and, you know, and, I, and I, you know, marketing, marketing is very strong because like I said, like I, I was homeschooled for a year. I wasn't part of a collective or anything, but it was just kind of just me and my mom just, you know, in the house and she was just teaching me different things. But I, for some reason, like I remember seeing the movie Mean Girls. And in the beginning, Lindsay Lohan had, you know, with I think her parents were I forget what type of employment they had, but they were in, in Africa doing some work. Um, with the Peace Corps or something, I don't know. Um, but she was homeschooled, and I, I always always remember that. And it kind of like it, it puts it Hollywood and you know other types of mainstream media. They they put negative stigma, you know, around the idea is in and of itself of, of homeschooling. And it you know the thought is that the children will be socially awkward. Um, there'll be a, some type of lack of social development. You know, kind of like I've, I've talked with people that are homeschooling their children, and they've let me know that like when they tell other people. That are not homeschooling, that they're homeschooling, they look at they, they look at them like they have three heads, you know. Um, so there's just so much like negative propaganda that we that we can push back that we should be able to push back on. We need to push back on. Um, to I think to try to like recruit more people, um, you know, in, into this type of thinking, at least thinking of the possibility of homeschool, especially now where you know, because those of us that already understood that there were there were problems with the you know compulsory school system or the public school system right um you know uh but now like with the pandemic you know things are kind of like in the open you know it's like i mean they were already in the open but i guess i understand how some people could 
you know, not really see it, you know, and, and oftentimes, a lot of times, the problems with the educational system in these these spaces is often um, the blame is often placed on the student, you know, like you notice that a lot when especially when uh, students attend the so called citywide magnet, you know, special admit schools, where if they don't do well, it's always seen as though and this is communicated by a lot of the teachers the teachers kind of have like a like a self um, like a like a like a built in defense mechanism. If the student doesn't do well, it's oh, well, they must not be able to handle the rigor. Right. It's not that I'm not a good I'm just not a good teacher or, you know, I'm not a good teacher. It's like, no, your child can't handle the rigor. And a lot of parents accept that and just say, oh, well, you know, yeah, you, you just you need to study more, you know, study harder. So like, you know, in those spaces, the, you know, kind of teachers have like some some teachers, um, they do have this kind of like protective mechanism where they don't have to they're not going to be held accountable um, for their lack of teaching ability, you know. Um, so, but now, like, you know, we see like, okay, we see what we have a better idea of what, you know, is going on in the schools and then, you know, just the virtual learning and, and all of that, you know, cause a lot of, you know, things were really shaken up. So now I think, and a lot of people had some experience. So hopefully more people are saying, well, you know, I kind of was the one that was facilitating their education, even if it was not really homeschooling, but it was more so school at home. But I, as a parent, I had to become more active in their, in their education, then maybe they'll think, you know, maybe they'll at least start to think about, well, you know, maybe this is something that we could do if we take it like more seriously. It's kind of like me when I started out as a teacher, I started out as a long term substitute and I kind of sat down and, you know, did some introspective work. And I said, you know, one day I could act okay, I've done this. I've been doing this substitute teaching work, but one day maybe I could actually become a good teacher. You know, if I took this seriously, so maybe that's the maybe that's the place that a lot of parents are in right now, um, while reflecting back on their experience, you know, facilitating a lot of their, their children's education. And then, of course, there's this, and I think maybe you know, the, uh, there's a pre presentation I saw that I want to tune into um, this week called um, you know the homeschooling um, imposter syndrome or something. So maybe that has to do with you know this last bullet point I have, where there's a lack of confidence, you know, in one's own teaching ability, and I think a lot of that just comes from um, just the way school is marketed to us, you know, and the way school is marketed to us, the way teachers are marketed to us. Um, you know, I think, you know, th there are some very highly qualified and, you know, um, teachers that are, you know, conscientious and do a good job, but then at the same time, there are a lot of them that are, that are not, um, you know, so, and a lot of, you know, if parents really knew, more parents really knew what really goes on in schools. And I'm saying this as a person that is a 16 year uh, veteran high school teacher. Um, and we have some of the most incompetent and just useless people in some of these schools uh, that you would ever meet. You know, people I wouldn't even want to be a greeter at Walmart um, working at these schools, unfortunately. Um, so again, so, you know, the, you know there's, a, there's, a, there's a sense of urgency, you know, in terms of us, you know, at least, at least supplementing, you know, what our children are, are getting. You know, in the in the in these spaces, and and in turn, and another thing is too that I want a lot of people to think about is in terms of homeschooling. A lot of the brunt work of running a school and and providing education that even takes place in schools, really a lot of it is organized. It's administrative, and you know, especially when we talk about you know about the sisters, about black women, you know, and and the way you know birthday parties are organized, Thanksgiving dinners, uh, prom send offs. All of these things, um, you know, the same type of um, organization, baby showers, all these types of things, the same type of organizational skill and ability that goes into that is the same type of organizational skill and ability that would go into managing and maintaining um, some type of homeschool um, situation or scenario. It really is. It really is the same type, same type of work. Now, when you get into the content of, you know, what's of what's being taught, that's that's a, that's a different conversation. But then even with that. If you as a parent are not able to provide the content and the instruction on your own, then, you know, again, you're, you're going out to find the resources. You know, it's really an issue of like finding the person that can or the people that can or the group that can, you know, so that's that's another part of it. Next slide, please. So when I talk about I've been thinking about this, this term hybrid homeschooling, I don't know if somebody has already coined this term or used this term. I'm sure they, sure they have because um, it just I'm sure people have been doing this for a long time. But like Nassim, my oldest son, and Asada, my, my nine-year-old daughter, their educational experience is kind of like a hybrid homeschool environment because I've always approached education 
or their education with the, un the firm understanding that I'm their, I'm going to be their primary educator. That it's not going to be the responsibility of the school primarily. The school is going, the school is only going to supplement what I'm doing, as opposed to vice versa. Where in a lot of situations, um, we're conditioned to just kind of send our children to the school, and there's this in loco parentis where they become responsible fully for their education, and then you know we supplement what the school is doing. Whereas you know, and and again, some that's an issue of that. That's just an exposure of my own privilege because me being a math teacher. Um, I've never had any anxiety about, you know, my, my child, you know, and their mathematical development. But then again, I, I study history as well. Um, I'm an I'm a avid reader. So I've never had any anxiety about, you know, being able to help my children with, you know, English language arts, um, you know, mathematics, um, the, the sciences, you know, to, to a certain extent. But, um, but yeah, but so I've always like, you know, I've, I was cleaning out my basement like the other day and I, I found, you know, an old uh, notebook where I had like, you know, from dated from the year 2000, from the summer of 2014, where I had like a, a curriculum, kind of like a quick and dirty written up curriculum for my son Nassim. Like when he was, you know, he, he was like, he was 2014, he was um, going on nine years old. He was almost nine. And this was work that we were doing. I was developing him with algebra, you know, at that age. Now he wasn't gonna be doing that in his school, you know, in that fall, but, that was irrelevant to me. I know what I know what I need him to know because I'm planning long term. And I again, I'm planning for him. I'm developing him to be a responsible handle of power and to be able to solve our problems. So then I kind of reverse engineer and back map from that. OK, well, what does he need to know at the age of nine? And the same thing with Asada. When I <clears throat> when I first had when I had my first opportunity to work directly with a homeschool collective here in Philadelphia, um, I would pick it, I, it met on Mondays. And I would pick her up from school on Mondays and we would come home, check in, you know, relax, um, get a snack or something. And then we would go over to the homeschool collective and she would be in there with the other students, you know, just doing the same work that they were doing, the same work that I prepared or, or one of the parents prepared. So there's like, you know, this, this, my, both my children, have, you know, they both of those children have went to school, but school was never the end all be all for them. Like school was never the end all be all for them. Was not, that was never my plan and um, never my goal. Also in terms of homeschooling versus schooling at home, this, is, this was a, a, a concept that I never thought of. Like around the beginning of the pandemic, I saw someone I think post about this on social media. And I said, wow, like that makes a lot of sense because they're not the same thing. You know, they're, they're definitely not the same thing. Um, schooling at home, you know, and, you know, and it's like, okay, well, your child is in the house instead of being in the school building. But the teacher still has full control over the, the education or the schooling experience. That's not that's not homeschooling. That's something different. Um, and we see this a lot with cyber schools. Like, and I think like students often make this mistake in terms of the nomenclature, because they say, you know, the school student will say, Well, I was homeschooled. And I say, Well, okay, well, you, you were homeschooled. Okay, so your parents were teaching? Like, nah, I went to, you know, I was uh, I got a laptop. And I had, um, you know, uh, yeah, I had a laptop and I would like kind of log in every morning. Oh, so you went to like a cyber school. Okay, all right. So that's a little different, these, these are a little different. So we have to like really be very explicit about the differences with these things. And I mentioned already like a, a, uh, in local parentis where the school really becomes the parent, you know, while the, while the child is in the building. Um, but I think we have to, we, as I said, we have to reorient ourselves to public school, um, charter school um, uh, system in terms of them. If, if our children are going to go there, they should only be there for practice from, you know, and to practice the skills that they have been taught by us in the community, in the neighborhood, on the block, um, you know, by elders and adults and maybe not even adults all the time because, you know, they're, they're children that, you know, um, are maybe teenagers. They're teenagers that can teach young people pre-algebra right now among us. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of that. My son works with me in all this math. He does tutoring. He's going to, he's a rising junior. He'll be going to the 11th grade in September. He tutors middle school students. So it doesn't always have to be an adult, you know, just as long as, you know, somebody from the community, you know. Um, next slide, please. And so now we get into like community support. So in terms of community support, 
I advocate that, you know, more, and this is probably an effort that, you know, I can, you know, do more, do more to uh, promote because this is something that I do personally, but I'm only one person and, and that's not enough. You know, um, teachers and professors should be able to pro should provide more academic support as well as educational resources to homeschoolers. Um, there also there also should be tutoring services for homeschoolers, and there also should be a, oh, in terms of positive propaganda, there should be an overall normalization of homeschooling, right? And we should also facilitate systems where because I think this this is the large part of it too that there aren't enough systems that are that are facilitated are provided where parents can really find online and in person classes that they need. I mean a lot of a lot of people find a lot of things, but it, sometimes it seems like from my experience and some of the conversations I've had with people that are in, you know, homeschool collectives that it's almost like, it's like difficult to like find like, okay, well, you want, we want our children to learn this. Okay. Well, where do we go to find the person or the people that can teach that? And then, you know, it's like, you know, it's, 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 it's like difficult at times, at least it seems. Okay. Next, uh, next slide. And here, this slide is just, you know, it's my contribution um, in terms of mathematics. Um, my YouTube channel where I, I've uploaded content. Uh, right now I have about mm, over a hundred videos, mainly algebra one and geometry, some pre-algebra, some what I guess what we would call elementary level mathematics. And I'll be adding, you know, more content on an ongoing basis. You know, so I'm, and also I have like the marketplace. This is available in the marketplace as well. Um, next slide. Um, so I guess in summary, I'm, I'm pretty much closing, closing, finishing up now. Um, in summary, like I, I view homeschooling, I, I guess, let me, let me back up a little bit because I don't think I, I mentioned this in the beginning. Um, like, like I'm a Pan-Africanist, so I look at everything through a Pan-Africanist lens and I see that, you know, you know, we need, we need, in order to, you know, the goal for me and those that share my, share my goal of Pan-Africanism is, is for independent nation building. But there are steps to that, right? Um, I see that as the only solution, um, but it requires in independent institution building, right? So, but within institution building, I see the most critical institution is the school, right? Um, and homeschooling models can help us to arrive at these schools. And again, like I said, not just black versions of the current schools, right? Because that's not what we want either, right? Um, it's kind of like, you know, with, uh, you know, enslavement, you know, we want to, we want to end chattel slavery. We don't just want to have, you know, black slaveholders now. Like we don't, we don't want to do that. That's, that's not, that's not a solution, right? We're trying to think like systemically, um, you know, and we can, we can do these things like step by step. So, but, I, but again, like I think that homeschool collectives can in turn lead us to larger independent schools that are controlled by us, controlled by the community. So the same parents, that are in control of and you know responsible for organizing and maintaining the homeschool collectives. Even if there was a school, and I mean, I'm, I'm kind of thinking anecdotally right now, or theoretically, but even if there's a school where there were 1,500 students in it, I believe that the parents of those 1,500 students and the stakeholders, you know, the grandparents, the uncles, the aunts, the cousins, you know, whoever of those students should still have just as much input into that school and that institution as they would have if it were just five, you know, children in a homeschool collective or 10 children in a homeschool collective. So it's really, it's also an issue of like scalability, right? And I, and I, I believe that that's possible, but I think we have to first like, you know, um, start having more of these conversations. And, not, and, and again, I guess what I'm saying is when I say we, let me be, let me be clear, not you all, because you all already know, you all have already been doing this, what I'm saying is people like, you know, people like me that haven't really been homeschooling and, you know, that, you know, kind of associates with people that don't homeschool. So I guess I guess what I'm talking about um, overall is like, you know, bridge building, bridge building between the homeschool community and the I guess the, I guess for lack of a better term, the non homeschool community so that, you know, we can start to embrace homeschooling as a concept more. And then use that, you know, to leverage and and really and and do some instance, some serious educational institution building. That would also lead to, you know, the building of, of other institutions as well. And I think that's how that's how the that's how the community can definitely like support and promote um, homeschooling. Because um, everybody wins. Everybody everybody will win. Because you know we're all part of the collective, 
And if our, if our, ch- our children learn, um, then that makes the, you know, that, that makes the community better. That makes the collective better, you know, but, um, but yeah, but I, uh, yeah, so that, I think I'm going to, I'm going to end there and we have, we have time. We have actually a lot of time for questions. And there's quite a few of comments and um, I, uh, I should have been reading them, but I couldn't share my screen and read them at the same time for some reason. Hey, that's, so, that's fine, that's fine. Um, let me go back to the beginning. Um, and um, I just wanna say we in the beginning of this, um, when we first started, you talked about you're not actually a PhD, but I, you remember I told you the historical um, meaning of calling yourself a professor back in the day, Vanessa Siddle Walker writes about it. You mm. have definitely demonstrated that that title is yours <laughs> within the black community, professor. Yes, Professor Parker. So thank you um, for sharing your thoughts with us. Um, so George says, yes, that was a seed in my consciousness for many years and ultimately got me to homeschool. I'm not sure what he was speaking to. He might have been- the next quote. Go, go for it, go for it. Yeah, I was I was speaking to uh, the Malcolm X quote. Mm. It's very powerful, very powerful. Yeah, that, and, that, that quote is like that to me. It's like some it's like some tough love. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's like some tough love because it's like ah oh, man, because it's like you know you, when you hear that it's like yeah, but you know my, my, my kids go to these schools and then it's like you know your your ego kicks in and you know you you want to get you get might get emotional get mad but it's like you know but brother's right though. You know, we, mm-hmm. we, we got to it's, it's motivational because like we, we got to do better. You know, we got to do better. So um, and, and I, I have started saying when I'm asked to speak places, particularly for black families, even if you're not going to homeschool, you can't leave your education up to whatever school you're going to. Mm-hmm. You, it is our responsibility to tell our children, to teach our children um, whether or not, wh- whichever way you decide to homeschool. I know I had to do it with mine. Mm-hmm. My mother did it with me. Um, you know, if I didn't know what my mama taught me, I don't know where I'd be. <laughs> you know, this, right, we right. need that knowledge to be shared. So um, and I think, how I to think be too, in this world. If, if I could add something, I think, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned responsibility. And I think we have to start to, I guess, covet, if that's an appropriate term, our responsibilities in the same way that we covet like privileges and gifts. Mm-hmm. Because we often look at, a lot of people, they look at responsibilities as like a chore or as something to try to get out of. It's like, I wanna, I wanna evade the responsibility. I kind of just wanna, it's like, like when people talk about adulting, like you know, being an adult is a problem because you know, when I was a child, I didn't have responsibilities, I didn't have to pay any bills. I just kind of, you know, I had food, clothes, shelter, and I had to go to work and mm-hmm. all that. But, um, you know, when you become an adult, you know, you, you, you're supposed to have responsibilities and, you know, we should, we should take more like ownership and guard our responsibilities in the same way that you would guard, like, okay, well, this is my home. This is my house. I'm going to protect my house. This is my car. I'm going to protect my car. This is my, you know, my, my child, you know, is, is, you know, it's, it's, you know, some, you know, a person that I'm going to protect, but even like your responsibilities and things that may be difficult and may require a lot of work, but they're still yours. That's true. Like that's 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 your responsibility. So that like the education of our children is is really our responsibility. And and it's gonna take some some work to try to like change the mindset because for so for so long we've been conditioned to think that that's somebody else's responsibility. Mm-hmm. You know. Um. So really, we just gotta start to just explicitly have that conversation. Like, wait, no, this is not somebody else's responsibility. It's ours. You know, it's it's ours. And then yeah. then we can talk about well, what does it look like? to actually take take hold of that responsibility and you know fulfill it and fulfill the responsibility. Mm-hmm. Okay, we have some more. Um, Kendra Price states, I agree about managing a micro school or co-op, but two of the biggest issues I see is finding and maintaining a facility that can accommodate such a place while keeping cost affordable. Also, if you gain nonprofit profit status, there would be an issue of discrimination potentially mm-hmm. if the school is Afrocentric. This would be a source of attack when government resources are involved. So, I mean, I'm glad, I'm glad I can't speak a lot about that because um, it's not my, I'm not as aware 
But um, I'm glad you're bringing these things up because, of course, these are things that we have to think about. Um, and it's not a reason to, I mean, it's just, it enables us to think of, to, to keep in mind things that we're going to have to consider as we move forward. Mm-hmm. Um, not a, not a reason to, to not do it. And I'm sure that's not why she made the comment. Absolutely not. No, right, right. they are. There are genius schools and freedom schools, mm-hmm. uh, which are micro schools and uh, self democratic schools popping up all over the country. Um, and for instance, Karima Green at the Genius School is one um, African American lady who is really, I want to say she's in Atlanta, but she is like amazing when it comes to talking about this. Um, but that for me that has been an issue is and i've asked the question to other micro schoolers because when you look at it from the caucasian standpoint of those that do these micro schools and pods they target wealthier um people because they can afford to finance these things and the church the evangelical church is will put facilities and money for free at their um for their use when it comes to um, African Americans and dealing with Black people with dealing with the micro schools, the first thing that really has to happen is a change of heart about homeschooling because we have been so programmed within the, and I'm speaking from the context not of Pan Africanism, but from the context of the church, mm-hmm. um, that we have been so programmed to only think that public school is the only thing to do that. Um, that first has to change. And some churches have started to open their doors during the pandemic, which is helpful. um, Because here's the thing, you're going to also run into, I actually worked and taught with a micro school. So um, it comes, the children have to have, they have to have insurance, okay, Mm -hmm. that there, these are costs. And so the insurance for them, uh, finding teachers, like if we could get black teachers to potentially find a funding source to be able so that they could have a living wage and divest from public schools altogether. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah. So that's all I was saying is mm-hmm. in terms of the, the first thing is where's the money coming from? Because with our community as well, we have to think about how are we going to make this affordable and make it to where, um, you know, kids that don't necessarily can afford, you know, private school tuitions and whatnot, how they can actually participate. I'm done speaking. Right. So, <laughs> oh, you know, I, I like, I, I, oh, go ahead. I, well, yeah, so I, I like what you were saying. And, you know, I think that I'm always, and maybe it's my, my business background, you know, from undergrad, but like, I, I'm just always thinking about marketing, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm just in terms of just studying America, just studying and just watching and just looking at the things that, a lot of people get involved in, um, just generally speaking, and you're just like looking like, why? Okay, why are they, why are people spending money on this? Like, why does this make sense? And then you sit back and you like, you, you watch social media and you watch YouTube and you just watch and you think back to all the, the television that you've watched growing up and you're like, it's commercials, marketing, people are constantly like, you know, this is onslaught to make people want to do certain things. So I think that, because like, I, I, I definitely agree with her points about the schools need to be, um, you know, for in order for a teacher, because you know it's it's a real life situation, real life decision you have to make. If you're a black teacher and you're working for the, for a school district and you're making you know sixty seventy thousand dollars a year, and that's enough to provide a you know a comfortable you know lifestyle for you and your family, or at least contribute to the lifestyle of you and your family. And then you say, well, I would like to help, you know, and work full time and, you know, in this small independent school, but they can only afford to pay me 30000 a year or 25000 a year. And it's like we live in a monopoly capitalistic society, you know, unfortunately, but it, it, that's what we live in right now. So how can I get how can I replace those resources? Um, and that's why I think marketing comes into play, because there's a supply. There's definitely a supply of students. And there's a supply of teachers because there are plenty of, um, you know, there are plenty, plenty, plenty of black teachers. Right. But then there has to be the support for the schools to make it, you know, inviting for the teachers to want to go and to think about that, to think about this like exodus, you know, 
Um, and I just, I just, I don't know specifically how to do it. Or what maybe the, the HBCUs. The maybe if you could get the HBCUs who are getting like millions of dollars right now, if they could somehow buy in, and maybe some of you know, just like we have, um, uh, what's his name, Deion Sanders, and some of these, you know, going the to Jackson the HBCUs. State. Yeah, 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 maybe some of these celebrities could start some things in finance, and maybe if we could go under the umbrella of the HBCUs, that man, that might be a thought. <laughs> that might be a start because they have laboratory, like Southern University has a laboratory school, right? But imagine if you could get the new next generation of teachers and the next generation of um, what not HBCU like admins to rethink education along these lines for the black community in, in K through 12. Right. And right. you start collectives like that. Oh man, I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's, so I'm glad like you bring that up. That reminds me, like I, I often had this conversation, like, you know, in the first, cause I, I teach here at Cheney and I teach um, one of the courses I teach is math for elementary school teachers. So these are like students that are education majors. They plan to teach, you know, on the K through eight level. And, you know, I, t I tell them like, you know, some, you know, some teachers, sometimes you, you get burnt out or even when I'm teaching students that are not education majors and I, and I promote like them becoming education majors and becoming teachers. And a lot of them will say, well, I never, I don't want to be a teacher. I can't teach, you know, I wouldn't want to do that. And I kind of challenge them on that because what I think happens is they don't, they, it's not so much that they don't want to teach, it's that they don't want to teach in this current system and in these schools. Mm -hmm. And even the ones, so I, I say, you know, you know, that's why we got to start having kind of more conversations and thinking about how can we create independent schools where we can teach in a way that we would actually want to teach. And even the, even the students that, um, you know, our education majors kind of like to, you know, not just not just to get it, get your education degree and go so you can go into the to the end of the current public school or charter school system. But think about creating, you know, or getting with some other people to create a, you know, create schools, you know, create schools that look different from the schools that we all went to. You know, if, if we all like I'm, I'm a product of public school, um, I went but I, I went to the, you know, so-called uh, quote unquote good schools for high school and middle school. But, you know, and I say quote unquote, because when you really get into the, the real analysis of these institutions, then you start to see that, you know, it's just a different type. It's like, it's like pick your poison, you know, because you're still going to get the cultural violence. You're still going to get the cultural imperialism. You're still going to get the white supremacy mythology. You're going to, you, you'll be able to develop, you have certain resources that some other schools won't have, but all the resources in the world devoid of some like cultural grounding that, you know, empowers you as a human being and empowers your humanity as a person of African descent, those resources are going to be weaponized against you. And then, and then you will be weaponized against your people without having that proper political and cultural grounding. And I don't even expect those institutions to provide that. So that, that and that's, that's, again, that's where the community comes into play because the community has to uh, provide that political and cultural grounding almost like I, like I said in, in the presentation, like almost like to vaccinate like our children against what they're going to what they're going to be subjected to in those good in the good schools or what or what some would term the so-called bad schools. Right. Either way, like that's something that that's the, that's work. Again, that's the responsibility of, of people right in the community, in your household and, you know, around or in other households that are that are around our children. Mm -hmm. We have a question from Joanne Foster. Um, Professor Parker, you mentioned using our education to fix the problems in our community. As a Pan-Africanist, how do you get people to understand the problems we face affect all of us and we need to unify to correct them? That's an excellent question. So how do we get people, so basically how do we get people to just understand the value of collectivism? Um, some more explicit conversations, because I mean, it's a lot of it, like I often think about, you know, even like growing up and hearing like the cliches, like what I, you know, I don't, I don't want to be crude, but, you know, hearing the, the cliche growing up, somebody says, well, what I eat don't make you defecate. I'll say that. Right. Um, so, but that, and that's the thinking, but the reality is no, it actually does. Like there's, there's, there's nothing that, you know, any one person can do as part of the collective 
that doesn't in some way affect other people in the collective. We, we like to think because of, I think, you know, again, this is a byproduct of monopoly capitalism, the, the social and economic system we live in, that, you know, rugged, rugged, individual, rugged individualism is, is the way because of that. So I think we have to kind of attack the rugged individualism and have some explicit conversations. And also, you know, again, I, I can, you know, we talk more about Amos Wilson, about, you know, people want individual liberties. And, you know, and I'm not saying that we should just throw all individualism out the window, right? I'm not saying that at all, because we're still human beings. We still should be able to express ourselves. But I, I just think that we should privilege the collective over, you know, ourselves as uh, ourselves as individuals. Now, everybody may not agree with that. That that's a, that's just the way I, I view things. Um, but and actually, you know, what I what I say is, you know, a lot even like a lot of the work that I do, people think I'm this very like generous, like selfless person, and I, I am to an extent. But when I really think about the work that I do, I'm really motivated by selfishness. But the difference is that I'm not oriented as a rugged individualist. I'm oriented toward the collective. So when I do something, I want the collective to win. Now, how do we get other people to think like that? Uh, again, just having conversations that show the benefit and the value in that, um, exposing them to, to individuals that thought like that. Like, I think one of the reasons that I'm like that, that I privilege the collective and, you know, the community at, at large over my own individual needs, um, primarily um, studying people like Kwame Touré. Um, studying people like John Henry Clark, studying people like Amos Wilson, studying people like Asada Shakur, um, you know, revolutionaries, you know, from the past that, you know, really, you know, did the work that they did and made a name for themselves because this was how they, this was how they lived their lives. And this was the type of world that they were working to try to create and still are, you know? Um, so, yeah, so I, I just think, I just think we have to like expose people to a, a different type of, and especially with, with young people, you know, we have we have we have role models, you know, um, even I think all, all people have role models. So the question becomes like, what what type of ideology does your role model possess? You know, does your role model possess a more individualistic orientation or does your role model uh, put the community first? Because a lot of people will say a lot of people have role models that are just very much, um, very much focused on accumulating financial resources by, you know, it kind of pervert Malcolm X's by any means necessary quote, mm -hmm. right, and approach, you know, it's like, I just want to make money at the expense of the community and at the expense of the collective. So, but then if you provide, you know, some other role models that, you know, were very much more community oriented, uh, much more oriented toward the collective that were willing to sacrifice for the people. Um, I mean, you know, and, and there are different levels, different levels to that. You know, um, and especially, you know, we're having these conversations, you know, with, with the young people ab about that, then, you know, they'll want to do that. But again, like it, it all is like every with everything we're talking about here, it always comes back to the community and the collective and education, because if, we, if we're going to have these conversations with young people about some of the people I just named and a lot of other people that I didn't name, then, you know, the space for that is really in an independent educational space. Because like a lot, there are people that would try to fight with public schools and charter schools to get them to put this in the curriculum. Mm -hmm. But I don't really, I don't personally, I don't really have time for that. I, don't, I think I think our time and our energy is is limited, and our resources are limited, and it would probably be better served trying to build, um, even if it's small, you know, small independent educational spaces where we can we can have those conversations. And we probably we probably also need to like leverage technology as well. You know, try to be more efficient with leveraging technology. Now with the internet, Zoom, Google Meet, um, uh, GoToMeeting, all these different applications and platforms we, we can use. And um, people have laptops and smartphones. Um, those may not be the most ideal because I think also we need to have, you know, human more human interaction, more face-to-face, -face, you know, connection. Yeah. But short of that, we can still have conversations, just like we're having a conversation right now, you know. Um, I think too, um, Professor Parker, in part of Joanne's question is that we as adults need to be unschooled. Mm -hmm. Like we've been taught, we have not been taught our full history. I didn't learn, and I still am learning our history, but my eyes were opened when I got my PhD to the truth about 
the strengths of the uh, African-American community from a scholarly perspective. And if you look at the way our historically we have come together to help one another and support one another, the answers are there. I mean, even parents who didn't have children way, way back in the day, they donated land, they donated lumber, they did what they could to make sure that children would have a school and a place to learn. And I don't think we, I think we've lost that mentality because we've been taught to be individualistic. Some, not all of us, but enough of us that it's destroyed our collectiveness. I wanna, we only have about three minutes left. I wanna read, I read says, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. She says, um, I like the idea of thinking collectively to support homeschooling. But one of the things I like most about it is my ability to cater to our practice to the needs of our family and children. I fear that seeking to build a new institution and be under the umbrella of an, of an other organizations and even founded on more African-centered values could hinder that independence and flexibility. I'd like the support and, and I'd like the support and community building around homeschooling to honor what we've built as families, thinking something to consider. I think we need to find a balance. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad she said that because you know I want to be very clear. Like I don't, I don't think I'm not advocating at all that we like you know replace um, larger institutions um, with uh, replace homeschooling, small homeschooling collectives, and, and homeschooling in the household with larger institutions. I just think that um, for those that that would attend large institutions, um, we can just kind of we can grow them like we can grow them organically out of what homeschoolers. Um, like Ari, like like what she has has been doing, so that's that's what I think, and um, you know, so yeah, so I definitely I definitely think we should find a balance, you know, because some people would want to some people would want to stay, you know, in a in a small setting, and I think yeah. that's fine. I think that's fine too. Okay. That's fine too. But I I just think that again, this is more for I guess my my presentation is is more for like you know um, introducing a conversation where we we try to connect with those that are that are not you know, exposed to the, the great value in, in homeschooling mm -hmm. and kind of should be trying to, because I'm, I'm really trying, I don't have, I don't have the uh, final answer for this, but I'm trying to figure out, I'm kind of grappling with this, like, how do we um, present it to our people and show, present it to people that have not really embraced it and show the value in it? Because, because really, like, I'm, like I said, there's like so much negative propaganda where it's like, it's just something for weirdos. You know, and it, and it shouldn't be like that, you know, but I think people say that because they just they haven't thought about it and they've never really seen how it works. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it works. You know, I, I, yeah, I've, I've seen it. I've worked with uh, work with students myself. Mm -hmm. um, and just the idea of, you know, it's like, why, why not have, as a parent, even, even if it's just you and your own children? Why not have control? Why not be able to maintain? I keep using the word control. I don't want to. I feel like that I'm using, it sounds oppressive when I keep saying it, but um, I'm not trying to be. But um, one minute remaining. So I'm about to wrap up right now. So, <laughs> so why not? Like with, with as parents, we're responsible for the well-being of our children in so many different areas of their life. It's like accept education. It's like accept education, like everything. It's like, OK, like food, like I'm going to feed you. I'm going to bathe you. I'm going to buy you clothes. I'm going to teach you this. I'm going to teach you that. Um, these these fundamental things just about living and being a human being. But when it comes time for you to learn math, you got to go to some, I got to send you to somebody else. When it comes time to, um, you know, develop your reading skills and, you know, read like, you know, more complex literature, I got to send you to somebody else. When it comes time for you to learn chemistry, um, study biology, um, study foreign languages and world languages, like I got to send you to somebody else. So it almost like, it's really a contradiction. It's really about exposing a contradiction where it's like, no, we should, we should be responsible for that also, mm -hmm. yeah. you know? Well, thank you very much. This was a very engaging conversation. Thank you for all of those that um, put something in the chat for us to think about. Um, Professor Parker, you need to read some of these compliments. They are very delighted about, you know, it will be good for your soul to read some of these words. Um, thank you all. And um, I hope you'll join us for another session soon. Appreciate it. Appreciate the time. <laughs>